I'd like to talk a little bit more about the sort of where we stand in terms of the big picture of cancer drug discovery and, and the, the design of, of clinical trials, which will be relevant to many people in the audience. And then we can talk about integrative genomics and some new technologies as well. And then we'll have some questions from here as well as from the overflow uh, room, which is overflowing, uh, which is good. Um, Julian, I'm going to let me start with you. Now, I introduced you as having uh, been the architect of a, of a hugely successful cancer drug in the past decade. And I know over the last uh, several years at Infinity, like ev every biopharma company, there have been setbacks. There have been drugs that have looked really promising. Um, and you may not even know to this day precisely where they failed. But I know that uh, in one particular case with, the, with the, one of the lead drugs at Infinity, uh, you found other indications and things are going going very well. I wonder, not really talking about infinity, but just stepping back, um, we've got a huge amount of talent uh, working on this problem. Many companies with as, almost as much talent uh, uh, and, and funding as infinity working on this. You, w w can you give us a sense of where, where we stand in, 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 in combating cancer? Are we finding smarter drugs? Are we identifying the right pathways? Are we finding the combinations? Um, because the last time I checked, you know, the FDA is still struggling to approve 20 new drugs a year. It's a great question. Um, and so first, let me say, I, th I think we're making progress. I mean, I think we're making progress on the technology side, which is informing how to do uh, better research and how to do uh, better clinical trials. And we are getting a more integrated system. But fundamentally, as scientists, I think you know we are forced to models and reduction is thinking uh, because you can't sort of solve an embodied problem, you know, you, you, in, in a laboratory setting, in a model ses setting, and then expect that 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 problem is recapitulated in the in the wild, in, the, in human disease. So <coughs> inevitably, we. When, when conducting a controlled experiment, there is a reductionism inherently involved in how to design that experiment and to, to set up the endpoint, maybe the, the standard endpoints that agencies want to see. Uh, but more and more, we have to sort of fight that reductionism and actually do uh, satellite experiments, uh, the kind that Jose was talking about, uh, make sure we really un try to understand the science better, collect tissue, uh, interrogate the tissue, learn and, and, and find uh, accidental discoveries, but accidental discoveries for the prepared mind then can be turned into sort of real advances. What about the, the, the range of chemical repertoires we have to actually target the, 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 the cancer targets that yeah. we've identified. You, you, Infinity was started with you know, uh, novel state-of-the-art uh, diversity-oriented synthesis from the Schreiber lab. Um, and featured here over this year and re recent years here, we've seen companies uh, looking at new, new com chemical space between small molecules and monoclonals. We've seen drugs like Avila, which is presented here, just been sold for a huge amount of money, to Celgene, looking at covalently binding drugs. Can you talk to us about some of the novel strategies that you think, maybe they're not your own, but the, sure. the, the, they're really going to show promise? Sure. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the point. So this is, uh, again, deals with just the small molecule space and three-dimensional space and small molecules. So the estimate, if you think about three-dimensional space, uh, is somewhere on the order of 10 to the 40th. It's a, it's a massive number. It actually is a bigger number than the number of atoms in the universe. Um, so uh, clearly, not all of that space is useful space. We try to then define what's the druggable space of that space. Um, and then we try to create rules about you know, uh, in the 90s, it was the Lipinski rule of five. Um, I ha happily uh, uh, not a subscriber to, to rule-based uh, drug discovery. But um, I think we try to sort of organize principles about um, making libraries of molecules that look drug-like. Well, if we're going to treat diseases of the future, looking in the rearview mirror at what looked drug-like uh, would never have produced a drug like Velcade, would never have produced a Villa's drug, because those are no-nos in the pharmaceutical industry to make covalent inhibitors or inhibitors with uh, atoms other than carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, sulfur. Uh, so if Velcade, if anybody cares, has a boron atom in it, the first and only known example of a, a, a you know, 
non-organic uh, uh, type of uh, uh, metalloid uh, main group element. So I think we have to sort of free our minds from conventional wisdom, which as John Kenneth Galbraith pointed out is not wisdom, uh, it's folly. Uh, and I think we have to be more expansive in the way we, in which we approach uh, chemical space. Now, we're assisted by many, many approaches. We have much better structural biology today. We have much better computational methods as how to dock molecules, how to do virtual screening. Um, so, plus we have mechanism. If we understand how a, a protein works, a machine works, an enzyme or a, uh, a receptor, well then we can maybe study that in terms of mechanism-based approaches as well. So I think, you know, um, it's incumbent on the chemists to still be good chemists, but it's to free their minds of rules and talk to our colleagues across the, uh, the way the biologists, uh, the, the enzymologists, the, the cell biologists, and eventually the clinicians as well, this is can we actually make uh, a, a substance that is, you know, suitable, suitably uh, deliverable uh, to patients. We bring in, bring in Jose on the far right. Uh, Jose, you design uh, and run a huge number of clinical trials. I wonder if you can give the audience a sense of what, uh, what advances you're seeing in terms of the, the technology of designing and maybe stratifying the patients so that presumably, obviously we, we can talk all day probably about the, the death of the blockbuster model and, and personalized medicine, but are you able now to with, uh, target the right subpopulations of patients as you begin the trial? Where, where is that? Right, so this is a very, that? yeah, so increasingly we do that. So the way that development was in, done in cancer was that you had a compound that you, uh, you know, in cell line screening was working and was killing cells or was doing whatever it was doing, and it was a purely incremental design. So you would do to, you would, the phase one was just designed to see if the therapy uh, was safe. You were looking for the pharmacokinetic uh, properties, you were looking for other things, and then you were not hoping to see any response there, and then you would move to the phase two, and then you would move to the phase three, which was to compare your, uh, your, your, your uh, study agent with the conventional therapy, and this was incremental approaches. The failure rate, so of drugs that made it into the phase two, only 18%, uh, if you look historically, um, went into the phase three and, and came out positive. So the failure rate was huge. And we're talking about clinical trials with thousands of patients, right? So, and, and, and that's gone now. So I think what happened now, we are going, we're doing smarter trials, smaller. Earlier in disease, you don't want to treat new, uh, study new compounds in patients that are bedridden and that have uh, five to 10 metastatic sites. That's not the place where you study new things. And, and also bring in much more of these platforms to understand what's going on. So uh, the classical stories that we do now is that in melanoma, we check for mutations. If you have a BRAF mutation, patients go into BRAF uh, uh, therapies with huge responses. PI3 kinase mutations, we enroll now patients in the first line setting. So patients with metastatic breast cancer, where we know that we have multiple lines of therapy that are approved, if the patient has a mutation, we offer them to participate in these uh, early trials, and we are seeing responses there. So we're going earlier, and we are going, um, uh, 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 you know, with a predefined population. So yes, that's the death of the blockbuster, and, and, and blockbusters are never gonna come back, uh, I don't think, mm. uh, unless for some principles that are uh, what Julian is talking, that could be, uh, I could see blockbuster in tumor microenvironment. I could see that. Mm. I could see if you have a therapy that interferes with drug delivery to the tumor, uh, that could work. But when it comes to the molecular pathways of the tumors, uh, we're gonna have a small niche for each case. Mm. So I think the challenge that we have is to see activity early on to be very, very proactive. So for example, a patient that responds to a therapy, it's mandatory that you try to biopsy that tumor and understand what is going on to compare uh, pre-therapy and on therapy. Those patients that respond to therapy and they progress, you need to do another biopsy and see what has been the acquired mutation or the driving force behind this acquired resistance. And then I think that is much more complex and this is uh, we have been working in the last uh, five years on the presence of compensatory pathways. Uh, so we now we learn that you block one pathway 
and the tumor has the capacity to activate an additional pathway that may serve as a rescue. Uh, I hope the list, the, the menu of pathways is gonna be uh, uh, limited, but we need to develop technologies to interrogate what's going on in real time and then have adaptive design. So that's what we are trying to do. What are, the, uh, what are some of the trials, if you can say, that you're most excited about at the, at the moment? So, so we just presented, uh, and Pauli Stagioli in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of, years ago, a couple of months ago, uh, the combination of an mTOR inhibitor and an anti-estrogen therapy uh, in breast cancer showing huge improvement in progression for survival. I am terribly excited about the uh, smart combinations like in melanoma. Uh, we are combining now MEK inhibitors with BRAF inhibitors because we knew that there was a feedback pathway that was being activated and we can block that. Uh, combined therapies against HER2, so we have proven that uh, tumors that are dependent on oncogene, if you target uh, with two agents that have complementary mechanisms of actions, you have huge synergy, so that's another thing. And in lung cancer, what's happening is absolutely amazing. We have ALK mutations, we have ROS mutations, we have EGFR mutations. So I think uh, in lung cancer also, we have changed the field uh, tremendously. Mm, excellent. John, I'm gonna come, John number one, I'm gonna come to you. Um, so, as I said, uh, reformed theoretical particle physicists now bringing integrative genomics and systems biology approaches to, to the Dana-Farber Cancer Center and one institute. And one of the things you're doing is, is sort of integrating a variety of data types that we've, we've just heard about, genomic data, clinical data. Can you give us a sense of some of the projects that you're involved in uh, and, and what's to be gained by it? It all sounds great, layering these data and what you can leverage, but, but uh, how is that working in practice? So I, I think this is an area where there's a real challenge and uh, there's a tremendous opportunity. The opportunity is really driven by the availability of data. I mean, you mentioned the fact that I'm a physicist by training and the explosion in physics um, and the transformation of physics happened in the 1800s, the late 1800s, early 1900s. And the rise of quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, uh, really what we think of as modern physics was driven by the availability of data. We're now in a position where we can start to think outside the box. We tend to think about averages and we look at different populations, we look at those populations and the question we ask, which has proved enormously successful, is if I look at two different populations of patients, responders and non-responders, treated and untreated, on average, how are they different? And that's summarized in the t-test. It's worked extraordinarily well. But when we look at those questions and compare those groups, what we're forgetting is that disease doesn't happen on average. On average, we're pretty healthy. Our cells are doing what they're doing. It's those few of the 30 million, division, 30 million cells that divide that something goes wrong. And we're starting to recognize, one of the interesting things I think we're starting to recognize is while there's a lot to be gained by looking on average, that a lot of the interesting biology is at the fringes. And that's why I mentioned this you know, diversity of tumors and how tumors appear, that we have to think about this heterogeneous population. Within that population, there are a lot of factors driving it. And one of the things that we understand is that they're genetic mutations. They're part of driving development and progression of disease. But there's gene expression data. That's a good sentinel for what's happening in the cell and may in fact drive many of the mechanisms that go wrong. But there's methylation. There's histone acetylation. And the nice thing is with new technologies, we're able to assess multiple different aspects of disease in the same patient, in the same sample. So we have the opportunity now to think beyond just doing a simple test and comparing what's different between our two populations. We can actually start thinking about within each population how the individuals or the individual elements are behaving individually and in concert. And Jose mentioned, you know, thinking critically about experimental design. One of the things that we see all the time is that people design experiments without ever asking how they're going to analyze the data, right? In software development, it's use case development. We think about how we're going to use the data once we have it and what questions we're trying to address. So we're in a position now where from the same samples, we're starting to generate these multiple different levels of genomic and regulatory and expression data and information. The question is, how do we put all these together? Your question is, how do we integrate this? And the answer so far 
is that we're phenomenally bad at doing that. There was a paper, a review paper that came out a few years ago, one or two years ago, about the state of the art in integrative genomic analysis. And if you read the paper, fundamentally what it says is we analyze each data type individually, and then we try to put it together, right? It's Julian's point about being overly reductionist, that we have to think about integrative approaches. So one of the approaches uh, a colleague and I, GCUN, have been thinking about is actually trying to model gene expression data in signal transduction networks. And with a, a postdoc who we were working with, Kimberly Glass, what we've been doing is we've been recognizing that inside cells, a lot of what's driving the processes involve communication between genes, transcription factors, their downstream targets. And so what we do is we start with a network that we infer from the literature. We take that network of transcription factors and downstream targets, and we turn to communication theory. And in communication theory, there's a, a, a method called affinity propagation or message passing. If I'm going to communicate to you, there are actually two partners, or in this case, one to many. But fundamentally, with each one of us, uh, with each pair, there are two partners that are involved in that communication process. I have to communicate information to you, so I have a responsibility to make that information available. You, on the other hand, have to be available to receive that information. If you're daydreaming, if you're looking at your iPad, if you're doing something else, you may not be fully available. And so we can take the available data that we have and start to model that communication process as a two-way process. And the thing that's really exciting about this is this is one of the first approaches we've really stumbled upon that allows us to start to think not just about one data type, if we start with gene expression, but multiple data types. Input from the literature, but also how methylation and histone acetylation and other factors influence those um, two functions, the responsibility and the availability. And what that's allowed us to start to do is to build predictive models then that capture some element of what we're seeing in, in what the regulatory process. It's, evolved us, it's allowed us to evolve from thinking about the right way to model things into going to my physics background, phenomenology. Can we model what we see? And the question suddenly shifts from is the model right to is the model useful? Does it inform us enough that we can then turn back and do the next set of experiments to look at the new drugs, to see how the drugs perturb the networks, to see if we can predict how the drugs perturb the networks, and to predict the next site where we may want to look for an intervention in the network. Tom Byrne. I was struck a few years ago when I read that more Americans believed in alien abduction than believed in evolution. Um, <laughs> hands up, no, never mind. Uh, but um, <clears throat> the, in a sense, the reason we're sitting here is that cancer is the embodiment of that alien abduction. I mean, you know, when you've got a cancer taking over your body, it's someone else. And so I think that one of our challenges in, in genetic molecular informatics is to actually truly characterize that alien invader and work out how that individual differs from the parent body so that, we can, so that Jose can kill it without killing the parent body. Um, and it just made me think that we need to kind of, when we approach cancer and genetic testing and information management, things always get blurred and we often end up talking about several different issues at once. So we've got an issue about characterizing the tumor uh, and I think that we're seeing uh, you know, in this conference all manner of examples where pretty soon molecular characterization of the tumor will be absolutely required, the norm. We're seeing it now with the BRAF and melanoma and all the other examples. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a bit like saying that you know, back in the old days we used to rely on t taking someone's pulse to decide whether they'd had a heart attack or not. You know, now you know, we just won't accept someone saying it's a bit blue or a bit red around the edges, therefore I think it might be. We need to know its molecular uh, phenotype. Then the second issue that that brings into the focus is the genotype of the patient. And I think that what we're going to see dramatically in the near, very near future is that people will expect to have near patient immediate diagnosis if they are BRCA carriers or mismatch repair gene defect carriers because that will have a huge impact on their immediate management and how you treat and, and, and approach them. So I think we will have diagnostics on the patients. Then we've got the preventive element, which is where I've been living. And I think the people who are genetically susceptible are the ideal group to develop treatments and preventions because preventions can only be, involve agents which are really well established, off patent, cheap, over the counter sort of things. And what we saw with the COX inhibitors, which we didn't get funded in NIH for our Aspen trial because they were too busy 
funding Vioxx. They said that's much more exciting. And it was. The trouble was they didn't know what the long-term effects of Vioxx would be. Uh, and they obviously found out it wasn't a good idea. Uh, so uh, prevention is, if I, 10 seconds. Yeah. Prevention uh, is, is a whole other world. And we need to be thinking about genotyping the whole population to work out how to best prevent cancer. And then that leads us back into the final zone, which is actually working out the true public health aspects of this. What can we safely do in a public health setting uh, that, would, that, that is safe? And again, our genotype knowledge, our systems analysis will, will help to decide whether things like folic acid, which I was involved with in the 1980s, uh, we, which you now all get in your diet, can we do other things like that to cut cancer risk in the population? So we've got several zones of, of activity where informatics plays a key role, but they are all distinct and need to be kept separate. Very good. Um, I'm glad you brought up molecular diagnosis because before I open this up to questions here in the, in the auditorium and in the overflow room, I just want to bring in uh, um, Kevin Kronitsky from Foundation Medicine uh, because I think for the technology that they're about to unveil in the next few months is one that's going to be, of, uh, it's going to be fascinating to watch its uptake and it's certainly going to be of interest to, to this uh, audience. It's, uh, I mentioned it on the, uh, the iPad uh, uh, mock-up that I showed in my introductory remarks. Um, and I invited Kevin just to spend a couple of minutes to just to talk about the platform, what you're trying to do, um, and what the, what the road ahead looks like in terms of genomic profiling of, of many cancers. Right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because when I saw John's slide, John Quackenbush's slide about turning the vision into reality, I'm thinking you know, that's a, a small part of what we're doing right now. And when you, when you looked at all his bullet points, I think we've checked off every one of those except the last one, which is actually informing, you know, the public that we're launching this. But a, a point to make is that although we haven't launched this nationally yet, we're going to do that at the ASCO uh, conference in Chicago, we're, we're seeing cases. We have been seeing cases since October. This is a fully informative genomic profile. It's a pan-cancer test across all solid tumor cancers. Um, we're currently looking at about 200 genes that really make up the universe of, allow us to look at the universe of currently known relevant alterations in, in solid tumors. And we're seeing, we, we expect to see two, maybe three cases a week. We're seeing 25, 35 cases a week now from clinical, you know, actual clinical um, cases alone. As a matter of fact, two days ago, we received 11 of them. So maybe we're pushing 50. And, you know, that's, that's astounding to, to me. And, you know, being in the world of diagnostics for 10 years, I've never seen a test that hasn't been launched yet have that you know, type of uptake. And it simply means that, you know, the test will be adopted because clinicians want and need this information. And most importantly, it's very complex and they need it in a way that is distilled down into a very intuitive report where they can look at it, they can see it in 30 seconds, and, you know, they can understand what, you know, from a molecular standpoint, what is that particular patient's tumor telling them. So we're seeing some pretty amazing things. I think the, the one point I'll bring up, I gave a talk yesterday, and for, for you know, those of you who, who did not see it, at the end, uh, I pulled out one patient, you know, one patient case. We're, we're starting to see, and we have since the beginning seen many novel things that have not, never been characterized, you know, before. We're certainly seeing a, a slew of, of cases where we have, you know, FDA-approved therapies. We mentioned, you know, BRAF 600E. We're seeing these in multiple cancer types, you know, uh, adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, things like this where we'll, the, the drug companies are extraordinarily interested in this, and we'll be able to get, um, you know, relatively quickly with diseases that are uh, as rapidly progressing as that, whether or not they work. Um, but the one, the one case that I think was interesting was, uh, it was a case of an individual who had, um, non-small cell lung cancer, had all of the appropriate testing done, all the target therapy, uh, targeted therapy that one could have, including the, uh, the you know, the FDA-approved Vices Fish test for the EML4 ALK translocation. It was negative. So we happened to get a sample. We ran the case. We found, um, we found an ALK translocation in Intron 19. It had not been previously uh, reported in any of the literature. And the patient was able to go on crizotinib. And I showed yesterday a CT and a PET scan a, a, of the patient uh, before being treated in about a month later and just, you know, significant melting of this tumor in, in the right, you know, hemithorax, the right lung of this patient. And, you know, these were beginning now, you know, again, it's only been available since October, but we're, we're beginning to get the letters and the emails and the outcome responses back. And what we're seeing is actually, is actually quite dramatic. So it's very, uh, very exciting. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. We're going to take questions from the audience now. Uh, 
Kip uh, over here and Jerry will uh, gladly hand the microphone to anyone who has a question for any member of the panel on any subject that you've heard or even ones that you haven't heard. And uh, we'll also go to the overflow room, flow room in just a minute or two. So please uh, just show your hand if you have a question for anyone. Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to ask the panel. Uh, we recently completed a set of cases from a biobank with lung cancer. And I asked, what did they have in, what did 50% of them have in common? So we found um, things like smoking, alcohol, uh, narcotic use, um, five comorbidities, most of which had lasted over a patient's lifetime. And we also found a fair amount of stress. It seems to me that now one can have a complete genome. Instead of just saying, what is cancer doing with this genome and how are we treating it? How do you take into account whether there's been tobacco exposure or really have um, a completely new way of diagnosing a patient and what's actually contributing to the uh, breakdown of the genome? So I'd like you to, <laughs> if you don't mind, is sort of discuss how a cancer patient doesn't arrive as a pure cancer patient. There's not just one alien going on. There's multiple aliens, and plus they're helping it by feeding it with tobacco. So, so how, how do you think this might impact genomic analysis and, and medical diagnosis? John? Well, I'll, since you mentioned aliens, we start with me. Um, uh, <laughs> that's quite clever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I think we've got besotted with whole genome sequencing and we're forgetting that we're just in the foothills of understanding this mountain range. Uh, we've heard, already heard mentioned, you know, histone deacetylation, uh, the, the epigenetics methylation effects. One of my colleagues is working very much on splice variation and there's a huge shift in splicing uh, in tumours, which we've only just begun to scratch the surface of, never mind all of those uh, microRNAs in between that are sort of playing the strings. So we, we've got to incorporate all of that information to truly understand the alien. Uh, and if we don't, then we'll be found wanting because I think uh, those, those epigenetic and environmental factors are extremely important. And stress you, relate, you refer to, I mean, the impact that that has on telomeres is really quite dramatic. Uh, and that reversible telomere shortening in people who are stressed you know, indicates that there is a clear direct impact of, of those sorts of factors in people's response to treatment. So all of that's going to be wrapped into the story, which is why I don't think that we're going to sequence people and drop it in a cloud and then access it endlessly. Because what we put in the cloud this year will look very out of date in two years' time. We need to be able to constantly reassess them. Julian? I'm very glad that you brought up smoking because with our HSP90 program, we're actually enrolling heavy smokers because in our phase 1B uh, study, we combined uh, ritaspamycin, and our drug, with uh, docetaxel in second, third, fourth line treatment. And what, paradoxically, we found all the responders were smokers. And moreover, y the best responders were the heaviest smokers, the 50 pack year uh, lot. And we're taking that clinical observation back to the laboratory and trying to piece it together. And I can just, sort of the working hypothesis is, the more you smoke, the more you acquire mutations, the more you acquire mutations, the more you're dependent on HSP90. So I think some of the, sort of the, gen the genomics shouldn't be ignored by any means, but they are snapshots of, uh, in time, of when you acquire the sample, which may be the archival sample, not the current status of the patient. Um, and you have to sort out that even though you find all these mutations, what's a driver and what's a passenger? And so that's another layer that we, we as a community have to figure out. But I, I, I love your question about the smoking because we, li we literally stumbled into this hypothesis and it has led to a randomized phase two trial to test exactly what you're, you're referring to. Your Quickly, John. expensive shirt can't take the weight of your microphone, so that's what's making that straight. Is that background. the problem? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I think that's a really important question. And, I, you know, John made the point earlier about large-scale studies. I really hope the next large-scale population-based study is everyone, and there's an opportunity to do that. But genomic data is only part of the puzzle. But having the external clinical data is extraordinarily important, but everyone is so concerned about data access and, and identifiability that I really think things have got to change. I've got a little boy, he's six years old, I guarantee you that by the time his, he's 15, his genome will be sequenced. I just don't want it on Facebook. But <laughs> that really points to the fact that the younger generations have a different idea about privacy. 
And that's why I think getting patients involved is so important. There's a company here in Cambridge called Patients Like Me, and they're running the largest unlicensed clinical trial in the world, where they just have people sharing information back and forth. And that's why I, I think we have to think differently, that the, the healthcare system has all these impediments in place to, to keep us from sharing that kind of data or for asking any question other than this very narrow question. But if we can get people involved sharing data and information, we have an opportunity to really look at the genes by environment by chance, yeah. things that drive cancer. Okay, let's try to squeeze in a few more questions. I want to go to the overflow room first, and then we'll take one here, and we'll take one over there. Uh, Mike, in the overflow room, can you hear me? No, no questions we, here, Kevin. No questions? All right, no worries. Um, Jerry, who have you got? Yes, Hi, Kevin. Gunnar, hello. Uh, I just want to uh, mention a word of caution. I mean, Ten years ago, you know, we were all very enthusiastic about proteomics and mass spectrometry and all that, and all the wonderful things that we will discover, uh, biomarkers, and you know, it's not got us very much uh, after all the investment we made. And again, in, in genomic uh, era, you know, we had this situation where at the cancer center, we actually do sequencing of patient uh, biopsies and all that. And we sit together with the, the genetic counselor and the medical oncologist, and we look at the data, and many times we realize that many of these SNFs, we don't know what they do. We, uh, we really don't know what, what's the function. And my clinical colleagues are always very consistent in asking me, they want meaningful use and actionable items. They are very practical. And at this stage, we are not really there yet. So it's, this is a very dangerous situation to try to overhype this. And then when people say that you don't deliver, then there's a very big disappointment in the community. Jose. Yeah, so I think, you know, I think the issue on whether we are hyping this or not, that's a good issue for debate. But if you look already over the last five years on what are the actionable mutations, if you wish, that have changed the lives of many patients, I can give you a whole list. Ten years ago, 85% um, of patients with HER2-positive disease died from disease, and today we are curing over 90%. 40% of melanomas have BRAF mutations, and right now with the right therapies, um, these patients have time to progression that are in excess of 12 months, which is remarkable. We have the lung cancer story, we have the ALK story, we have the ROS story I mentioned, the EGFR story. Uh, we, if you go to um, leukemia or if you go to lymphoma, um, it's, it's also many things happening there. Now, you have the latest data with the BTK, um, with the BTK um, uh, inhibitors in B cell malignancies uh, with very tough subtypes of... Um, so, uh, I think I would agree with you. We have to be careful of not hyping it, but also we have to be careful of not saying that we are not making progress because we are making progress. Now, um, is that as fast as we would like to do? No. Uh, and what I'm concerned and that's the point that John was making, is that we have to think beyond looking at mutations alone because uh, I think that one thing that we've learned, uh, at least my take into that, from all these um, uh, uh, sequencing efforts in multiple tumors, that the number of actionable mutations are going to be f uh, limited. And, you know, all these papers coming out in Nature, um, they don't tell you something obvious right there, you know, like the last paper last week, uh, on triple negative breast cancer, when you look at that, uh, you're kind of a little bit disappointed, right? Uh, they're going to be some more things. So you'll need to study networks. You'll need to study, uh, uh, you know, of course, all these methylation patterns and, uh, uh, that are there. And then the issue that you brought about proteomics, uh, yes, you're, you brought perhaps the most complex of all, right? Uh, how are we going to do all these proteomics analyses? Uh, and that's tough. But, so, but, uh, but I think if you, somebody is on vacation in Mars and, uh, for 10 years and comes back and sees what we're doing, uh, these people will be surprised. You, you actually made a very good phrase. You said, not there yet. It's a bit like having one, I've got grandchildren now. You know, they ask after about th three minutes into the journey, are we there yet? <laughs> I mean, 10 years is a very short space of time from having genome information to start in turning into, into interventions that work. And, and, you know, it's taken us 18 years to do the aspirin trial I described to you. It's taken 25 years for many other drug developments. So that's just a normal time span. 
Uh, but, I, but I would, I th one of the great things is that the genomicists are coming back to monogenic disease because they can see that that's an early win, you know? Uh, and it's, it's, it, it's somewhere where you can actually demonstrate, as Jose just illustrated there, you can say, these people really are alive because we can prove they've got a genetic susceptibility. So monogenic disease is still very important. Big scale, one in 17 of us have a, have a rare disease. Uh, but as I, said, I just reminded of the story, the blind man is bitten by a dog in the street and he reaches out with a sweet to offer it to the dog and a passerby said, that's very generous. He said, not at all, I'm trying to work out where its backside is so I can kick it. Uh, and <laughs> so the attraction of monogenic cancers is that it holds one piece still. It's better to understand the effect of smoking and all the other things. So I think that we shouldn't move away too fast from that high ground. It's very, pra very practical and profitable. Quick comment from Julian and then we'll take one just last question. Just a quick comment on, on the hype. I loathe the hype. I hope we haven't been hyping anything on, on the panel for you. But I just would point out what is not hype is the BRAF development, the development of the BRAF drug uh, was extraordinary because as it was approved, we already knew the escape and resistance mechanisms which were being published contemporaneously with, with the approval. That kind of compression of information in time is unprecedented. So that's not hype, that's actually reality. And it wasn't just genetics, it was a lot of good cell biology that came out of lots of different laboratories. Final question, I believe, uh, from the audience. Yeah. Yes, uh, I was wondering if the panel could com uh, comment on how to tackle complexity in cancer. So I think it's po possibly fair to say that as um, sequencing comes out profiling, that people's uh, cancers are kind of personal to them. Perhaps e each one is unique. And we're talking about personalized medicine, but I, I think that a therapy, by, by definition, needs to be stratified. So how, do, how does one tackle uh, the cancers where we don't have a BRAF mutation, the, the tumor types where uh, there isn't an obvious handle? Well, I, I think that's, that's part of the whole process of, that we're talking about, which is discovery, right? There, there are two aspects of this. You know, do you sequence a genome? Why? The answer is you have to first ask the question of why you're going to do it before you do it. If I sequence my son's genome, the chance that I'm going to learn something useful is pretty small. My father-in-law has colon cancer. If we sequence his genome, we may learn something because we're asking specific questions about actionable mutations. Those are things we can ask today. Your question it really is driven at discovery, and that's why I come back to the, the fact that I think we need large numbers of patients really involved. And we have to take advantage of the fact that these technologies allow us to do multiple sequencing assays from each patient potentially, because what we'd really like to do is go back to that discovery, build up a catalog of what the mutations are, understand the ecosystem, understand the environmental factors, understand how the microenvironment of the tumor influences what happens. But that's really a research question. But the thing that gets me excited and out of bed every morning is the idea that we're going to have the data soon to be able to address those questions. And with a $100 genome, we can ask questions like the one you pose that we couldn't have asked with the million-dollar genome or even the thousand-dollar genome. I think you can all comment on this, uh, Jose. Right. So, uh, you know, I think the starting point is what uh, Vin said. So you, for each case, you have the uh, tumor fully sequenced and fully analyzed, and then you try to know, based on that information, what's the best, uh, what's going to be the likely outcome of the tumor and which are the best approaches that you can do. So that's one thing. Now, going to the individual thing, to the individual case, uh, an experiment that we are doing right now, and we are very excited, is that we are trying to, we identify, we realize that many tumors will respond differently uh, with different activation pathways as a way to counteract whatever you're doing. That's a melanoma story. So we have now clinical trials in which we start, uh, after, you know, one therapy on day one. We biopsy the same tumor on day eight. And then we, uh, doing uh, a number of assays, we try to identify which are the pathways that are being shut down and which ones are being turned on um, as, as the consequence of doing that to that specific tumor. And then you would then add the companion uh, 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 therapy to block the pathway that seems to be the dominant one in, 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 in preventing tumor death. So this is a new concept of adaptive design and we just received a huge grant to do this uh, in, in patients, and we're very excited. We're going to do it, again, taking an, a, a, a reductionist approach in one subset of patients, but if that works, uh, I could see this something that you could do. And then another thing that we have not talked, you could uh, use functional imaging to help you with that. Uh, you could label pathways, and, and, and you could see what's get, 
turn on and off. And also you could identify by imaging the behavior of different metastases. You know, so then <coughs> metastases. So that's another thing that we have not discussed, but that's extremely important. Julian? Julian and then John, last word. Yeah, so, um, you know, taking John's perspective, if we um, can understand susceptibility factors, and that's by doing large populations, and that's, you know, I'm not projecting 20 years from now. Where will we be 20 years from now in understanding complexity? If we can get uh, at least a, 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 a semblance of understanding susceptibility factors, we now can possibly think about individualized therapy in the, ter in the form of cancer vaccines. Break immune tolerance for the, uh, what's about to happen uh, in, to, to the patient in the, in the future. And that should be a pretty cheap approach. Uh, and the big winner here has been the, uh, in the infectious disease arena. So the HPV vaccine basically will eliminate cervical cancer. And we just need the public to be aware of this and make sure that the girls and the boys get vaccinated. And a generation from now, there's no more cervical cancer. So I think, you know, if you project long enough into the future, integrate all this information, we will understand pathways today, direct, you know, complex um, tumor biology in metastatic disease or in early stage disease. But if you back up and back up, we'll eventually understand the susceptibility th factors by family or by individual. John. One of my jobs is being genetic lead for our National Institute of Health Research, and I've got a program grant called the Collaborative Group on Genetics in Healthcare, and the key word is collaborative. I think that if we're going to address complexity, we have to collaborate and not be too tight-fisted and competitive in our information gathering. Uh, and that cuts across the whole system. This is a really big challenge, and we'll only win if we do it together. Uh, there are several dimensions of that. One of them is understanding the variation in the whole human genome across the planet. 90-odd percent of the variation is in countries that can't afford more than $3 a day for their health care. So we need to partner up with them to collect that data and deliver something back to them. And we've got a thing called the Human Variome Project, uh, which is trying to do that. Um, the other thing I think, though, John touched on is the consent issue. In the developed world, we need to be able to track long-term, longitudinally, what happens to the phenotype uh, in, in response to different interventions. And we can only do that if we revisit this whole issue of consent. We've got far too individualized and far too narrow in our consent. So we spend most of our money getting consent to go back to do something again. Uh, and if we just got generic consent uh, and a good protection for patient identifi identifiable information so that we can link genotype to long-term phenotype, uh, and we've just produced a government report which has specified this as something we're going to open as a major national debate so that we can start using NHS data long term and link it to people's genotypes long term and try and solve some of this complexity in the years to come. Thank you, uh, all of you. I want, we have to leave it there. I want to thank uh, John Quackenbush, Julian Adams, Sir John Byrne, and Jose Baselga, not just for all of your time and contributions today, but for all the work you're doing. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much. Yeah.